And joining us now to talk about your health is Dr. Simon Chaturvedi, professor of neurology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and director of the University of Maryland Medical Systems Stroke Program. Doctor, thank you for joining us. We want to talk about stroke in women in particular. Are any of the risk factors different in women? Yeah, I think it's helpful to divide that up into uh, before age 50 and after age 50. Uh, after age 50, uh, the risk factors are pretty similar. And so we frequently talk about the big four uh, being high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, and then history of smoking. And so the good news is that uh, all four of those are uh, treatable and controllable to some extent. And then you should probably add in uh, as a fifth risk factor, uh, obesity, and uh, p potentially sleep apnea, uh, which is a risk factor for both men and women. Uh, before age 50, uh, obviously there are some differences because uh, women can become pregnant. And so pregnancy is a, a condition where the blood, uh, or you have an enhanced tendency for blood clots. And also in the four to eight weeks after pregnancy, there's also an enhanced tendency for blood clots. And so that's uh, an increased risk time for uh, women uh, to have strokes. And then below age 50, we also have uh, the issue of uh, oral contraceptives and birth control pill use because uh, estrogen containing uh, birth control pills, they enhance the uh, tendency for clots to develop in the body and that can lead to uh, strokes. Uh, luckily, the risk is fairly low, uh, but it's definitely higher in women over age 35 and women who smoke. And, uh, and each year at our medical center, I would say we probably see about uh, Four to six women, four to six women who have a, a stroke while taking birth control pills, and so although it's a relatively rare, it's something that definitely does happen. Is there anything that women in that age group can can do to mitigate the risk uh, of oral contraceptives or or pregnancy related strokes? No, uh, for uh, oral contraceptives, definitely don't take it, them if you're a, a smoker, and especially a smoker age over age uh, thirty five or forty. And, uh, and then another group where there's a little bit of concern is uh, women who have uh, migraine with uh, warning symptoms called aura. And there is some concern that if you have a, a migraine with aura and you take birth control, uh, birth control pills, you may have slightly higher risk. And so if you have migraines, it would probably be best to get those under control as well and also discuss the uh, individual risks uh, with your provider. For pregnancy, I think the important thing is to have uh, early uh, access to pregnancy care and make sure that uh, the blood pressure is well controlled, uh, that there's no uh, uh, what we call gestational diabetes, which is diabetes developing during pregnancy. And uh, But really, the blood pressure is, I think, the most important factor. And of course, uh, avoid uh, smoking during pregnancy and avoid any uh, drug use. Now, what about strokes that are connected to a heart rhythm uh, abnormality called AFib, atrial fibrillation? Are women more likely to, to get AFib or to have that complication of it? Yeah, once again, it's important to uh, look at age because before age 75, uh, men definitely have higher risks of AFib compared to women. Uh, but over age uh, 75, uh, AFib is the leading cause of stroke in women. And, uh, and that's uh, partly because uh, women uh, live longer. And so the percentage of women over age 80 is significantly higher than uh, the number of men. And so because women live longer, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, women over age 75 who have AFib-related strokes. And it's, it's estimated that there are about 50,000 more women disabled from stroke each year in the U.S. compared to men. And also many, uh, some uh, people may not realize that about 60% of the deaths in the U.S. due to stroke occur in women. And, uh, and that's partly as a result of, uh, as I said, with the fact that women live longer and there's a, there are a higher number of women in the overage 80 group. And uh, so interestingly, we're tr uh, trying to start one program at the University of Maryland Medical Center to screen women for AFib uh, if they're over 70 and if they have risk for AFib, such as high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, or a history of heart failure. Now, if you uh, find women in that situation or men in that situation, are um, anti-clotting medications always prescribed? And maybe talk a little bit about the, the risks and benefits of, of those drugs. 
Yeah, the anti-clotting medications are very effective. They can reduce the risk of stroke by about 60 to 70 percent. Uh, but unfortunately, they're uh, actually underutilized in the United States. And so there are a lot of patients who should be on them uh, who are not. And that, that occurs for several reasons, including the fact that uh, sometimes clinicians uh, overestimate the risk of bleeding uh, or patients may not be uh, fully aware of the risks of stroke. Uh, but the, the medications are uh, effective in both men and women. And, uh, and so usually uh, the doctor will look at the patient's age, uh, whether they have heart failure, whether they have uh, vascular disease elsewhere in the body. Uh, but in general, uh, the majority of patients over age 65 with atrial fibrillation uh, should be on uh, uh, anti-blood uh, thinning, medi uh, blood thinning medications or medications that impair the clotting system. Uh, and, and they should have regular follow-up with their physicians to make sure that they're, they're adhering to the medication and taking it as prescribed. Let's uh, focus for a bit on your work as director of the University of Maryland Medical System Stroke Program. That, that's something that affects all of the institutions in the system? Yes. Yeah, one thing which we did uh, uh, way back in uh, 2019 is we started a, a stroke uh, clinical network all across the University of Maryland Medical System. And one thing, uh, there are a couple of uh, goals of that is that we want to have the same level of care uh, regardless of which institution you present to. And if you present to the emergency room on the Eastern Shore uh, or in the uh, greater Baltimore area, we want to make sure that there are consistent protocols in terms of patients who are evaluated for uh, either clot-busting medication or potentially interventional therapy for stroke. And interventional therapy for stroke uh, can be quite remarkable in that the interventional physician can uh, pull out a clot in the, from the brain which is obstructing the blood flow, and that can lead to a significant improvement in the patients. And we've seen some who have remarkably improved even within the first uh, 24 hours. And uh, we have a, a few videos on our website of patients who've uh, benefited tremendously from interventional treatment. So I would encourage viewers who have interest in that to learn more about uh, the in interventional treatments for stroke and also to uh, seek urgent medical attention because those procedures are most useful if they can be done within six hours of stroke. They can also be helpful uh, for select patients up to 24 hours of stroke, but it's uh, important to uh, seek rapid attention uh, if you're in, in that circumstance. And, and to do that, you need to know that you need rapid attention, right? You need to be able to recognize the, the symptoms of a stroke in, in yourself or, or in somebody nearby. Yes, uh, definitely. And the patient actually experiencing the stroke, they may not be able to uh, call 911 or they may not be able to uh, recognize the symptoms uh, in all circumstances. And so if you have uh, atrial fibrillation or a long history of hypertension or diabetes, or if you have heart problems, it's important that your family members be aware of the warning signs. And you should definitely educate your significant other, your children, or people that you come in frequent contact with to recognize the warning signs of stroke. Uh, there's one tool that we use called uh, BFAST, which stands for balance, eyes, face for facial droop, uh, speech for speech problems, and uh, A for arm weakness, and uh, and then T for time. And uh, time is to, that's a reminder to call 911 in case the person has one or more of these symptoms. And uh, for, for the arm, uh, we ask the patients to like hold up their arms for 10 seconds and if one side drops to the uh, ground or uh, is uh, uh, fading on one side, and if there's clearly uh, asymmetric weakness, that could be a potential sign of stroke. And so that's important for the family members to know. How much has stroke care changed since you got into the field of neurology? <laughs> it's been uh, uh, like a light bulb. Uh, like back when I was doing my uh, residency. I don't want to date myself, but when I, when I was doing my training, uh, there was really no specific treatment for somebody who was having an acute stroke. And then in the mid-1990s, uh, the use of uh, clot-busting medications arrived on the scene. And then in about uh, 2015 was the first demonstration that the interventional therapies were useful. And so that was the uh, clot retrieval or clot removal from the uh, brain circulation. And so that's really uh, led to a, a massive change all across the country because now there are many hospitals which are so-called comprehensive stroke centers 
which can have the uh, clot retrieval available 24 hours a day. And if your local hospital is not a comprehensive stroke center, then at least they should be linked with a comprehensive stroke center so that patients can be uh, transferred uh, quickly uh, uh, when the symptoms develop and if it looks like a potentially large stroke. And, and that's how the system works. So the idea in that situation isn't that you need to figure out where the comprehensive stroke center is and get yourself there. It's just get into the system. Yeah, residents of Maryland are fortunate because the uh, leaders within the state and the emergency medical services, they've given a lot of thought as to how to uh, send patients to the best hospital uh, in, in for the uh, particular circumstance. And so if, if it looks like a potentially large stroke and a devastating stroke, many times the uh, uh, paramedics will take you directly to a comprehensive stroke center and they'll bypass the smaller hospital nearby. And, uh, and so that's been very useful in terms of uh, allowing more patients to have uh, access to uh, proper therapies and to uh, potentially have a life-saving uh, treatment. Lastly, uh, let's spend a second on TIA events and um, the, their predictive ability to, to say that somebody, you know, without treatment is, is at risk of a serious stroke. Yes, uh, yeah, it's important for uh, viewers to know about the concept of uh, TIAs, which are also called uh, mini-strokes. And that means that some patients will have uh, temporary weakness or temporary loss of vision or temporary speech problems. And the symptoms may last 5, 10, 15, or 30 minutes, and then they'll resolve by themselves. And uh, it's important not to ignore that because some uh, that can be a, a potential warning sign of a stroke. And uh, sometimes you may get only one warning before going on to develop the full-blown stroke. And so if you have those symptoms, and especially if you have risk factors, uh, that we've discussed, like high blood pressure or diabetes or atrial fibrillation, it's important to uh, go to the emergency room and seek medical attention and have a, a value, uh, evaluation by a neurologist, if not in the emergency room, then uh, hopefully uh, quickly as an outpatient. Dr. Simon Chaturvedi is director of the University of Maryland Medical System Stroke Program. Doctor, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Uh, pleasure to speak with you tonight. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.